Welcome to part 6 of the SCA 80Q Amplifier Kit series. In part 1, I unboxed the never opened 1978 kit. In part 2, I tested the capacitors, resistors, and semiconductors. In part 3, I repaired the bent and scratched faceplate. In part 4, I completed the first section of the manual, mechanical assembly. And in part 5, I completed the second section, wiring the main chassis. If you missed those videos, you may want to go back and check them out. Links in the description. The manual for the kit is broken down into four sections, mechanical assembly, wiring the main chassis, wiring the front panel, and final assembly. In this video, I'll complete the third and fourth sections, wiring the front panel, and final assembly. And in the end, I'll fire up the amp to see how it performs. Stay tuned to see if you can figure out what went wrong. Before we begin wiring the front panel, let's hear what Dynaco has to say about the process. Wiring the front panel. Note that lugs on the controls, with the exception of the selector switch, are numbered in a clockwise direction when viewing the back of the control. And the right channel, red wires, is nearest the panel and has the low lug numbers. The upper rows of lugs on the rocker switches, with the exception of MS, are for the left channel. In general, you should try to keep components and wires which connect to the upper lugs above the switches and those to the lower row below the switches. Keep green wires separated from red wires and cross them at right angles when necessary to maintain maximum channel separation. Keep component leads short so that they will not interfere with the front preamplifier board when the panel is assembled to the main chassis. To enable you to trace wires on the pictorial diagram, some distortion of wire placement is necessary, so you should use the photograph of the front panel on the next page as a guide. Thanks, Dynaco Lady. I think I'm ready to begin. Step 1. Prepare a 1 and 1 quarter inch red wire. Connect one end to lug 3 of BC and the other to lug 2 of VC. Wait, which controls are BC and VC again? Okay, maybe I'm not quite ready to begin. Let me label the controls and switches to make it easier for you to follow along and for me to keep my sanity. Okay, back to step one. Let's do it. Step one, done. Step two, connect a two inch wire to VC7 and the other to LS6. Step two, done. Step three, connect a 0 0.022 microfarad capacitor to LS6 and the other to LS5. Okay, here's the capacitor. Strange looking, isn't it? It appears to be ceramic, but have you seen ceramics that look like this before? I haven't. The kit came with a number of these, ranging in value from 0 0.0033 microfarad to 0.33 microfarad. Despite research, I found no info on these caps so I've dubbed them tubular ceramics. These tubular ceramics are often used in the kit where you'd expect to see a film style cap, but the only plastic caps in the kit are these 0.47 microfarads on the amplifier boards. Now generally you'll hear a lot of advice to never use ceramics in the audio signal path due to nonlinearity and microphonics. Nonlinearity means the capacitor can change value due to frequency or temperature changes, and microphonic means it can pick up external vibrations and add that sound to the signal. Because of this, I could have swapped the ceramics for film caps, but I chose not to. That's because for me, the point of vintage audio is to enjoy the equipment as originally designed. When I want to listen to modern components, I listen to modern components. And not classic equipment that's been modified in an attempt to bring it up to date. So, if Dynaco chose ceramic caps, let's hear how this amp sounds with ceramic caps. And in the next video, in addition to listening tests, I'll show you a complete set of bent tests of the amp, including power, frequency response, THD and signal to noise ratio, and more. So we'll get a chance to not only hear just how good Dynaco's original design was, but to also put it to the test. Now back to step three. Connect a 0 0.022 microfarad capacitor to LS6 and the other to LS5. Let me just grab a little solder. Thanks, puckers. And step three, done. Step four, install an 18K resistor to VC1 and LS5. Step four, done. Steps five through 44 continue in the same manner as the previous steps, so let's move through those quickly. See you at step 45.
steps 5 through 44 done. Steps 45 and 46 have us install 0.02 microfarad capacitors to the power switch as shown here on the schematic. As you may recall from part 5, instead of the capacitor Dynaco provided for C37, I installed a safety capacitor. In that case, it was because it was across the line, where if shorted, could damage the transformer or cause a fire. In the case of the capacitors on the power switch, I'll also use safety capacitors. That way, if there's a high voltage surge, they'll open instead of shorting, preventing damage to the transformer. Former. Now, if you missed part five and want to learn more about safety caps, go back and check that video out. Links in the description. Okay, let's install the two safety caps and continue through to part 50. Great, steps 45 through 50 done. What's next, Lady Dynaco? You will next wire the selector switch. Be very careful of this, for the phenolic wafers are relatively delicate and you must be careful that the long wires do not put undue stress on them. Be careful that you do not twist the lugs on the rivets which hold them, as the rotational timing of the switch contacts is critical and twisting the lugs could result in malfunction. The switch lugs are numbered clockwise, starting at the top of the switch when looking at it from the front of the panel. Lug number 9 on both wafers, which are identical, has two independent sections. When connections are called for here, they will specify the forward or back portion of the lug. In all other positions where a double lug appears, the two sections are to be soldered together when the connection is made. Do not allow excess solder or rosin flux to flow down the lugs onto the switch rotor contact area, or malfunction may result. I'll be careful, I promise. Okay, step 51, install the selector switch. Here it is, and there it goes. Looks good, step 51, done. Steps 52 through 85 have us wire the selector switch. Let's do it. Steps 52 through 85, done. And we're finally at the last section, final assembly. What do we need to know, Lady Di? Final assembly. Set the front panel aside and prepare to wire the back panel. In the following steps, reference will sometimes be made to pairs of short lugs on the input socket strips. These are located between the long lugs of the numbered sockets. These short lugs will be identified by a dashed number, as in 1-2, and connections are made to both, soldering them together when called for. The long lugs will be identified by a single number. Okay, got it, thanks. Steps one through seven of this section tell us to wire the back panel. As with the front panel, I'll begin by labeling the terminals. <laughs> Steps 1 through 7, done. Steps 8 and 9 have us install the line cord and strain relief. Here's the line cord. Note that it's ungrounded and non-polarized. Step 8 tells us to mark the cord 3.5 inches from the end, tin the wires, and bend the cord sharply at the pencil mark. To do that, I'll use this pair of pliers with a smooth jaw. Pliers like this are handy for gripping or smoothing wires without chewing them up. To make this pair, I file the teeth off, but you can also purchase pliers with a smooth jaw as well. Let's squeeze the cable. Insert it into the strain relief, connect the two halves, squeeze the outer portion, and snap into place. Looks good. Step 8, done. Step 9, connect the line cord to the AC outlets. Before I do that, take a look at this more modern line cord. Note that the grooved wire connects to the neutral prong and the smooth wire to the hot. Let's mark the smooth side of the Dynaco cable as hot and the right side of the AC outlets as hot and wire accordingly. 
Now, even though the amp doesn't use polarized AC, at least I know that if I insert the smooth side of the plug into the hot of a receptacle, that the right side of the accessory jacks is also hot, as with a modern polarized outlet. Step 9 done. Step 10. Install the front panel to the main chassis. Here's our front panel. We're instructed to install just the two corner screws, tilt the panel out for working, and place the six wires from OS and HP between the transformer and PC19. Step 10 done. Step 11, connect the end of the coiled wire from C7R to HP6. Here's the wire that's connected to HP, which is the headphone jack. Step 11 done. Step 12, connect a seven inch red wire to HP6. Step 12 done. Step 13, connect the end of the coiled wire from C7L to HP2. Step 13 done. Step 14, connect a 13 inch green wire to HP2. Step 14 done. Step 15, as you tilt the front panel into its upright position, twist capacitors C7L and C7R clockwise to keep the coils tight. Looks good. Step 15 done. Step 16, connect the long black wire from OS 12 to the ground lug. Step 16 done. Step 17, install the back panel with only two corner screws and tilt the panel out for working. Step 17 done. Steps 18 through 54 have us complete the wiring for the amplifier. Can you say Montage. montage. Steps 18 through 54, done. Where do we stand, Dinah Lady? This completes the wiring of your SCA80Q. Check to see that there are no unattached wires and no unsoldered connections. Clip off any excess stubs of wires to make a neat job. Check to make sure that the connections to each eyelet on the circuit boards shows a smooth flow of solder from the wire to the circuitry. There are no connections to eyelet 7 and 8 of the preamplifier boards. If the unit was wired for 120 volt use, there will be no connections to lugs 2 and 4 of the rear panel lug terminal strip. Lug 2 is used only if a special grounded power cord is necessary. Now turn the chassis over and shake out any bits of wire or solder. Check the twisted wires from the power switch to make sure that they are not pinched by the chassis. Position the twisted groups of wires from the selector switch as shown in the photograph below. In particular, the groups from the rear wafer should be separated from the front wafer groups to preserve maximum channel separation. Be sure none of the leads from the front panel touch the front pre-amplifier board circuitry. Check the resistor nearest the ground lugs on PC19 to be certain that its lower lead cannot touch the chassis. Also, make sure that no connecting wires are likely to come into contact with any of the power resistors on PC19, as these will get quite hot in normal operation. Check to see that red and green wires do not closely parallel each other, unless they are twisted groups or are connected to the same point. The parallel wires from OS and HP on the front panel to the outputs on the back panel do not matter. For best channel separation, red and green wires should cross at right angles to each other. General placement of wires should conform more closely to the photograph than to the pictorial diagram, which must necessarily be distorted to enable you to trace each wire. Make sure that wires which connect to the center lugs of C11 do not touch the outer ground lugs of the capacitor. Check the power switch to make sure there is no possibility of shorted connections between the lugs. The lead of the 5 microfarad capacitor from the rear 
SS wafer should not be able to touch the bare wires between the pre-amplifier boards. The wires to the solder, or ground lugs, on the heat sinks should not be able to touch the heat sinks or the cover when it is installed. Okay, thanks for that thorough checklist. I think I'm ready for the final steps. Set 55, insert a brass sheet metal screw to the back panel to serve as the ground terminal. Set 55, done. Set 56, insert the fuse into the fuse holder. Done. Set 57, install the front plate. Set 57, done. Set 58, install the knobs. Set 58 done. Set 59, install the thumb screws to the speaker terminal strips. Step 59, done. It's at this point that I connected the amp to a signal generator, sent core dummy load, and oscilloscope to make sure it was working properly. As I turned up the volume, here's what I saw. Severe distortion and no power. After doing some signal tracing, I found the following conditions. There was a clean signal coming out of both preamplifier boards. Under load, the signal on both amplifier boards at each transistor was distorted. At Q1, the first transistor in the amp boards that the signal encounters, these were the scope readings at the emitter, base, and collector. There was a clean signal coming from the headphone jack, but when a headphone was plugged in, the right speaker switched off as it should, but the left did not. Based on this evidence, what do you think went wrong? A bad power supply? A bad or wrong transistor? A bad or wrong capacitor? A bad or wrong resistor? A bad or wrong diode? Or a short somewhere in the amp? Let me know your guess in the comments, and if you get it right, I'll announce your name in the next episode. Stay tuned! Looking for a shiny new gadget for your bench? Some good books on electronics, vintage hi-fi or old radios? Indispensable tools, cleaners or other products? Check out my new Amazon shop and help the channel. Lots of great products I actually own, use and recommend. Plus my thoughts on each one. Link in the description. To stay updated, please subscribe to my channel and click the bell to receive notifications when I release new videos. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. I'll see you soon.